Chapter 43, The Battle of the Sand Belt. In Merlin's cave, Clarence and I, and 52 fresh, bright, well-educated, clean-minded young British boys, at dawn, I sent an order to the factories and to all our great works to stop operations and remove all life to a safe distance, as everything was going to be blown up by secret mines, and no telling at what moment. Therefore, vacate at once. These people knew me and had confidence in my word. They would clear out without waiting to part their hair, and I could take my time about dating the explosion. You couldn't hire one of them to go back during the century, if the explosion was still impending. We had a week of waiting. It was not dull for me, because I was writing all the time. During the first three days, I finished turning my old diary into this narrative. Into this narrative form. It only required a chapter or so to bring it down to date. The rest of the week I took up in writing letters to my wife. It was always my habit to write to Sandy every day whether we were separate, whenever we were separate, and now I kept up the habit for the love of it, and of her, though I couldn't do anything with the letters, of course, after I had written them. But put it in time, you see, and it was almost like talking. It was almost as if I were saying, Sandy, if you and Hello Central were here in the cave instead of only your photographs, what good times we could have. And then, you know, I could imagine the baby goo-gooing something out in reply with its fists in its mouth and itself stretched across its mother's lap on its back and she a-laughing and admiring and worshipping and now and then tickling under the baby's chin to set it cackling and then maybe throwing in a word of answer to me herself and so on and so on. Well, don't you know I could sit there in my cave with a pen and keep it up that way by an hour with them. Why, it was almost like having us all together again. I had spies out every night, of course, to get news. Every report made things look more and more impressive. The hosts were gathering, gathering, down all the roads and paths of England, and the knights were riding, and the priests rode with them, to harden these original crusaders, this being the church's war. All nobilities, big and little, were on their way, and all the gentry. This was all... This was all as was expected. We should thin out this sort of folk to such a degree that the people would have nothing to do but just step in front with the Republic and... Ah, what a donkey I was. Toward the end of the week, I began to get this large and disenchanting fact through my head. That the mass of the nation had swung their caps and shouted for the Republic for about one day and there an end. The church, the nobles, and the gentries then turned one grand, all-disapproving frown upon them and shriveled them into sheep. From that moment, the sheep had begun to gather in the fold, that is to say, the camps, and offer the their valueless lives, and their valuable wool to the righteous cause. Why, even the very men who had lately been slaves were in the righteous cause, and glorifying it, praying for it, sentimentally slabbering over it, just like all the other commoners. Imagine such human muck as this conceive of this folly. Yes, it was now death to the Republic everywhere. Not a dissenting voice. All England was marching against us. Truly, this was more than I had bargained for. I watched my 52 boys narrowly, watched their faces, their walk, their unconscious attitudes. For all these are a language, a language given us purposefully, that it may betray us in times of an emergency, when we have secrets which we which want to keep. I knew that thought would keep saying itself over and over again in their minds and hearts. All England is marching against us, and ever more strenuously imploring attention with each repetition ever more sharply realizing itself to their imaginations. Even in their sleep, they would find no rest from it. But here the vague and flitting creatures of the dream say, All England, all England is marching against you. I knew all this would happen. I knew that it would ultimately, the pressure would become so great that it would compel utterance. Therefore, I must keep, be ready with an answer at that time, an answer well chosen and tranquilizing. I was right. The time came, they had to speak. Poor lads, it was pitiful to see. They were so pale, so worn, so troubled. At first their spokesman could hardly find voice or words, but he presently got both. That is what he said. He put it in the neat modern English taught him in my schools. We have tried to forget that we are English boys. We have tried to put reason before sentiment, duty before love, our minds approve, but our hearts reproach us. While apparently it was only the nobility, only the gentry, only the twenty-five or thirty thousand knights left alive out of the late wars, we were of one mind and undisturbed by any troubling doubt, 
each and every one of these 52 lads who stand here before you said they have chosen it is their affair but think the matter is altered all england is marching against us oh sir consider reflect these people are our people they are bone of our bone flesh of our flesh we love them do not ask us to destroy our nation well, it shows you the value of looking ahead and being ready for this thing when it happens. If I hadn't foreseen this thing and been fixed, that boy would have had me. And I couldn't have said a word, but I was fixed. I said, my boys, your hearts are in the right place. You have the thought the worthy thought. You have done the worthy thing. You are English boys, and you will remain English boys, and you will keep that name unsmirched. Give yourselves no further concern. Let your minds be at peace. Consider this, while all England is marching against us, who is in the van? Who, by the commonest rules of war, will march out in front? Answer me. The mounted host of mailed knights. True, they are 30,000 strong. Acres deep they will march. Now observe, none but they will ever strike the sand belt. Then there will be an episode. Immediately after that, the civilian multitude in the rear will retire to meet business engagements elsewhere. None but the nobles and gentry are knights, and none but these will remain to dance to our music after that episode. It is absolutely true that we shall have to fight nobody but these 30,000 knights. Now speak, and it shall be as you decide. Shall we avoid the battle, retire from the field? No! The shout was unanimous and hearty. Are you, are you, well afraid of these 30,000 knights? That joke brought out a good laugh. The boys' troubles vanished away, and they were gaily to their posts. Ah, uh, they were a darling 52, as pretty as girls, too. I was ready for the enemy now. Let the approaching big day come. They would find us on deck. The big day arrived on time. At dawn, the sentry on the watch in the central came into the cave and reported a moving black mass under the horizon and a faint sound which he thought to be military music. Breakfast was just ready. We sat down and ate it. This over, I made the boys a little speech and then sent out a detail to man the battery with Clarence in command of it. The sun rose presently and set its unobstructed splendors over the land, and we saw a prodigious host moving slowly toward us, with the steady drift in a lined front of the wave of the sea. Nearer and nearer it came, and far more and more sublimely imposing became its aspect. Yes, all England was there, apparently. Soon we could see the innumerable banners fluttering, and the sun struck the sea of armor and set it all aflash. Yes, it was a fine sight. I hadn't seen anything to beat it. At last we could make our details. All the front rain. No telling how many acres deep were horsemen, plumed knights in armor. Suddenly we heard the blare of trumpets. The slow walk burst into a gallop, and then, well, it was wonderful to see. Down swept the vast horseshoe wave. It approached the sand belt. My breath stood still, nearer, nearer. The strip of green turf beyond the yellow belt grew narrow, narrower still, became a mere ribbon in front of the horses, then disappeared under their hooves. Great Scott, why the whole front of that hose shot into the sky with a thunder crash and became a whirling tempest of rags and fragments, and along the ground lay a thick wall of smoke that hid what was left of the multitude from our sight. Time for the second step in the plan of campaign. I touched a button and shook the bones of England loose from her spine. In that explosion, all our noble civilization factories went up in the air and disappeared from the earth. It was a pity, but it was necessary. We could not afford to let the enemy turn our own weapons against us. Now ensued one of the dullest quarter hours I had ever endured. We waited in a silent solitude enclosed by our circles of wire and by a circle of heavy smoke outside of these. We couldn't see over the wall of smoke and we couldn't see through it. But at last it began to shred away lazily and by the end of another quarter hour the land was clear and our curiosity enabled to satisfy itself. No living creature was in sight. We perceived that additions had been made to our defenses. The dynamite had dug a ditch more than a hundred feet wide all around us and cast up an embankment some 25 feet high on both borders of it. As to the destruction of life, it was amazing. Moreover, it was beyond estimate. Of course, we could not count the dead, but they did not exist as individuals, but merely as a homogeneous protoplasm with alloys of irons and buttons. No life was in sight. 
but necessary there have been some wounded in the rear ranks who were carried off the field under the cover of the wall of smoke. There would be sickness among others, there always is after an episode like that, but there would be no reinforcements. This was the last stand of chivalry in England. It was all that was left of the order after the recent annihilating wars. So I felt quite safe in believing that the utmost force that could for the future be brought against us would be small, that is, of knights. I therefore issued a congratulatory, congratulatory proclamation to my army in these words. Soldiers, champions of human liberty and equality, your general congratulates you. And the pride of his strength and the vanity of his renown, an arrogant enemy came against you. You were ready. The conflict was brief, on your side glorious. This mighty victory, having been achieved utterly without loss, stands without example in history. So long as the stand so long as the planets shall continue to move in their orbits, the battle of the sand belt will not perish out of the memories of men. The boss. I read it well, and the applause I got was very gratifying to me. Then I wound up with these remarks. The war with the English nation as a nation is at an end. The nation has retired from the field in the war. Before it can be persuaded to return, war will have ceased. The campaign is not only one that is going to be fought. It will be brief, the briefest in history. Also the most destructive to life. Considering from the standpoint of the proportion of casualties to numbers engaged, we are done with the nation. Henceforth, we will only deal with knights. English knights can be killed, but they cannot be conquered. We know what is before us. While one of these men remains alive, our task is not finished. The war is not ended. We will kill them all. Loud and long continued applause. I picked the great embankments thrown up around our lines by the dynamite explosion. A mere lookout of a couple of boys to announce the enemy when he should appear again. Next, I sent an engineer and 40 men to a point just beyond our lines to the south to turn a mountain brook that was there and bring it within our lines and under our command, arranging it in such a way that I could make instant use of it in an emergency. The 40 men were divided into two shifts of 20 each and were to relieve each other every two hours. In 10 hours, the work was accomplished. It was nightfall now and I withdrew my pickets. The one who had the northern outlook reported a camp in sight, but visible in, with the glass only. He also reported that a few knights had been feeling their way toward us and had driven some cattle across our lines, but that the knights themselves had not come very near. That was what I was expecting. They were feeling us, you see. They wanted to know if they were going to play that red terror on them again. They would grow bolder in the night, perhaps. I believe I knew what project they would attempt, because it was plainly the thing I would attempt myself, if I were in their place, and as ignorant as they were. I mentioned to Clarence. I think you're right, said he. It's the obvious thing for them to try. Well, then, I said, if they do it, they're doomed. Certainly. They won't have the slightest show in the world. Of course they won't. It's dreadful, Clarence. It just seems an awful pity. The thing disturbed me so that I couldn't get any peace of mind for thinking of it and worrying over it. So at last, to quiet my conscience, I framed this message to the knights. To the Honorable, the commander of the insurgent chivalry of England, you fight in vain. We know your strength. If one may call it that by name, we know that at the utmost you cannot bring against us above five and twenty thousand knights. Therefore you have no chance, none whatever. Reflect, we are all well equipped, well fortified in number 54. 54 what? Men, no minds, the capablest of the world, a force against which a mere animal may no more hope to prevail than may idle waves of the sea hope to prevail against the granite barriers of England. Be advised, we offer you your lives. For the sake of your families, do not reject the gift. We offer you this chance, and it is the last. Throw down your arms and surrender unconditionally to the Republic, and all will be forgiven. Signed, The Boss. I read it to Clarence, and I said I, and said I proposed to send it by a flag of truce. He laughed the sarcastic laugh which, was, which he was born with and said, Somehow it seems impossible for you to ever fully realize what these nobilities are. Now let us save a little time and trouble. Consider me the commander of the little knights yonder. Now then, when you are the flag of truce, approach and deliver me your message, and I will give you your answer. 
I humored the idea. I came forward under an imaginary guard of the enemy soldiers, produced my paper, and read it through. For an answer, Clarence struck the paper out of my hand, pursed up a scornful lip, and said with lofty disdain, Dismember this animal and return him into the basket to the baseboard knave who sent him. Other answer I have none. How empty is theory in the presence of fact, and this was just fact and nothing else. It was a thing that would have happened, and there was no getting around that. I tore up the paper and granted my mistimed sentimentalities a permanent rest. Then to business. I tested the electrical signals from the Gatling platform to the cave and made sure that they were all right. I tested and retested those that commanded the fences. These signals whereby I could break and renew the electric current in each fence independently of the others at will. I placed a brook connection under the guard and authority of three of my best boys who would alternate in two-hour watches all night and promptly obey my signal, if I should have occasion to give it. Three revolver shots in quick succession. Sentry duty was discarded for the night and the corral left empty of life. I ordered that quiet be maintained in the cave and the electric lights turned down to a glimmer. As soon as it was good and dark, I shut off the current from the fences and then groped my way out of the embankment bordering our side of the great dynamite ditch. I crept to the top of it and lay there on the slant of the muck to watch. It was too dark to see anything. As for sounds, there were none. The stillness, death-like. True, there were the usual night sounds of the country, the whir of night birds, the buzzing of insects, the barking of distant dogs, the mellow lowing of far-off kind, but these didn't seem to break the stillness. They only intensified it and added a gruesome melancholy to it in the bargain. I presently gave up looking. The night shut down so black, but I kept my ears strained to catch the least suspicious sound, for I judged I had only to wait and I shouldn't be disappointed. However, I had to wait a long time. At last I caught what you may call in distinct glimpses of sound, dull, metallic sound. I pricked up my ears, then held my breath, for this was the sort of thing I had been waiting for. The sound thickened and approached from the, toward the north. Presently I heard it at my own level, the ridge top of the opposite embankment, a hundred feet or more away. Then it seemed a row of black dots appearing in that ridge. Human heads? I couldn't tell. It mightn't be anything at all. You can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. However, the question was soon settled. I heard the metallic noise descending into the great ditch. It augmented fast, it spread it all along, and unmistakably furnished me this fact. An armed host was taking up qu its quarters in the ditch. Yes, these people were arranging a quiet little surprise party for us. We couldn't expect entertainment. We could expect entertainment about dawn, perhaps earlier. I groped my way back to the corral now. I had seen enough. I went to the platform and signaled to turn the current on of the two inner fences. Then I went into the cave and I found everything satisfactory there. Nobody awake but the working witch. I woke Clarence and told him the great ditch was filling up with men and that I believed all the knights were coming for us in a body. It was my notion that as soon as dawn approached, we could expect the ditch's ambuscade, thousands, to swarm up over the embankment and make an assault and be followed immediately by the rest of their army. Clarence said, they'll be wait wanting to send a scout or two in the dark to make preliminary observations. Why not take the lightning off our outer fences and give them a chance? I've already done it, Clarence. Did you ever know me to be inhospitable? No, you're a good heart. I want to go and... Be a reception committee? I will go too. We crossed the corral and lay down together inside the two fences. Even the dim light of the cave had disordered our eyesight somewhat, but the focus straightaway began to regulate itself, and as soon was adjusted for the present circumstances. We had to feel our way before, but we could make out to see the fence post now. We started a whispered conversation, but suddenly Clarence broke off and said, What is that? What is what? That thing yonder. What thing? Where? Beyond you, a little piece, a dark something, a dull shape of some kind, against the second fence. I gazed and gazed. I said, could it be a man, Clarence? No, I think not. If you notice, it looks a lit. Why, it's a man leaning on the fence. I certainly believe it is. Let us go and see. We crept along on our hands and knees until we were pretty close, then looked up. Yes, it was a man, a dim great figure in armor, standing erect with both hands on the upper wire. And of course, there was a the smell of burning flesh. Poor fellow, dead as a doornail, and never knew what hit him. 
He stood there like a statue, no motion about him except that his plumes swished about a little in the night wind. We rose up and looked through the bars of his visor, but couldn't make out whether we knew him or not. Features too dim and shadowed. We heard muffled sounds approaching. We sank down to the ground where we were. We made out another night vaguely. He was coming very stealthily and feeling his way. He was near enough now for us to see him put out his hand, find an upper wire, then bend and step under it and over a lower one. Then he arrived at the first night and start, started slightly when he discovered him. He stood a moment, no doubt wondering why the other one didn't move on, and then he said in a low voice, Why dreamest thou here, good Sir Mar? And then he laid his hand on the corpse's shoulder and just uttered a little soft moan and sunk down dead. Killed by a dead man, you see. Killed by a dead friend, in fact. There was something awful about it. These early birds came scratching along after each other, one about, about one every five minutes in our vicinity during half an hour. They brought no armor of offense but their swords. As a rule, they carried the sword ready with the hand and put it forward and found the wires with it. We would now and then see a blue spark when the night would cause it that caused it was so far away as to be invisible to us. But we knew what had happened all the same. Poor fellow, he had touched a charged wire with his sword and been electrocuted. We had brief intervals of grim stillness, interrupted by piteous regularity of the, by the clash made by the falling of an ironclad. And this sort of thing going on right along, it was very creepy in the dark and lonesomeness. We continued to make the tour between the inner fences. We elected to walk upright for convenience sake. We argued that if discerned, we should be taken for friends rather than enemies, and in any case, we should be out of reach of swords, as these gentries did not seem to have any spears along. Well, it was a curious trip. Everywhere, dead men lying outside the second fence, not plainly visible, but still visible, and we counted fifteen of those pathetic statues, dead knights standing with their hands on the upper wire. One thing seemed to be sufficiently demonstrated. Our current was so tremendous that it killed before the victim could cry out. Pretty soon we detected a muffled and heavy sound, and the next moment we guessed what it was. It was a surprise in force com coming. Whispered Clarence to go and wake the army and notify it to wait in silence in the cave for further orders. He was soon back and we stood by the inner fence and watched them, watched the silent lightning do its awful work in that swarming host. One could make out but little of the detail. He could note that the black mass was piling itself up beyond the second fence. That swelling bulk was of dead men. Our camp was enclosed by a solid wall of the dead, a bulwark, a breastwork of corpses, you may say. One terrible thing about this was the absence of human voices. There were no cheers, no war cries. Being intent upon surprise, these men moved as noiselessly as they could. And always, when the front rank was near enough to their goal to make it proper for them to begin to get a shout ready, and of course they struck the fatal line and went down without testifying. I sent a current through the third fence now, and almost immediately through the fourth and fifth. So quickly were the gaps filled up. I believe that it was time now for my climax, and I believe that the whole army was in our trap. Anyway, it was high time to find out. So I touched a button and sent 50 electric suns of flame on top of our precipice. Land, what a sight. We were enclosed in three walls of dead men. All the other fences were pretty nearly filled with the living, who were stealthily working their way t forward through the wires. The sudden glare paralyzed this host, petrified them, you may say, with astonishment. There was just one instant for me to utilize their own immobility in, and I didn't lose a chance. You see, in another instance, they would have recovered their faculties. Then they would have burst into a cheer and made a rush, and then my wires would have gone down before it. But, uh, but that lost instant lost them their opportunity forever. While even that slight frame of time was still unspent, I shot the current through all the fences and struck the whole host dead in their tracks. There was a groan that you could hear. It voiced the death pangs of 11,000 men. It swelled out the night with awful pathos. A glance showed that the rest of the enemy, perhaps 10,000 strong, were between us and the encircling ditch and pressing forward the assault. Consequently, we had them all and had them past help. Time for the last act of this tragedy. I fired the three appointed water revolver shots, which meant turn on the water. 
There was a sudden rush and roar, and in a minute the mountain brook was raging through the big ditch and creating a river a hundred feet wide and twenty-five feet deep. Stand to your guns, men open fire. The thirteen gatlings began to vomit death into the faded ten thousand. They halted, they stood their ground for a moment against the withering fire, then they broke, faced about and swept toward the ditch like the chaff before the gale. A full fourth part of their force never reached the top of the lofty embankment, for three-fourths reached in and plunged over to death by drowning. Within ten short minutes after we opened fire, armed resistance was totally annihilated. The campaign was ended. We, 54, were masters of England. 25,000 lay men lay dead around us. But how treacherous is fortune. In a little while, say about an hour, happened a thing, be by my own fault, which, but I have no heart to write it. Let the record end here.